hey, good morning, Mariners Church. We want to welcome you to our very first online gathering. We're so excited that you could join us. Uh, we know that many of you are watching right now from the comfort of your living room or your kitchen, perhaps. Uh, and this is a great opportunity to remind ourselves that the church is not a place, but the church is a people. So we can rejoice that we as Mariner's Church and as part of the larger church and the body of Christ can still meet, read his word, worship him together. So uh, just a minute, we are going to invite you wherever you are to stand as we sing some worship songs together. And so since you are probably in your living room, the worship uh, is going to be done from my living room. So from my living room to your living room, I want to invite you to stand as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you
Our sins and grief. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Aren't you glad that we have a friend in Jesus, as Alex just sang, and a friend that we can pray to? You know, as I was anticipating uh, speaking to you all this way under the re restrictive circumstances that we've all been experiencing, some scripture came to mind uh, written by the Apostle Paul while under restrictive conditions himself from a prison in Rome. He wrote these words to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He said, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead descendant of David according to my gospel for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal but Timothy the word of God is not imprisoned Paul got the word out to Timothy by way of a letter and we are going to keep getting the word of God out to you by letter by email by text by phone call uh, and by Sunday morning internet services, and we're so thankful that we can do this. Our greatest need in these days is to hear the Lord speak, to hear his word. And so let's ask him now to speak to us. Let, would you pray with me? Father, thank you that we have the means today to get the word out to the Mariner's Church family. Lord, use it to root us in faith, a faith that will sustain us in the storm and use it to grow our love for you and our love for one another. Use it to strengthen our hope. I pray that all who are in the hearing of this message would receive it today, not as the word of man, but for what it really is, the word of God, which does its work in those who believe it. Lord, I pray we would believe it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over the last several days, uh, the fear of the coronavirus has, has spiked as the number of cases in infected countries has multiplied. Over 200,000 cases have been reported, over 100 nations. Thousands have died. The nation of Italy is pretty much shut down uh, after being hit after China. Uh, the most recent report when I wrote this sermon of cases in the United States was 9,644 cases. And every state, it's on the rise. Life has changed here for us in America. Major universities have moved to online. The Naval Academy is not open. Disneyland has shut its gates. Uh, March Madness did not happen this year. Uh, there, there's all kinds of changes. The NBA, the NHL, the Major League Baseball have sus suspended league play to the tune of loss, losing millions of dollars. My brother, who just recently returned from Israel, almost got stuck in Palestinian territory in Bethlehem because they could not cross the border back into Israel because of the coronavirus. In a recent article, uh, by in the Annapolis capital, I read that that gun sales across America are spiking. Retailers are saying the buying frenzy is being fueled by consumers who are worried that people are becoming so desperate, so unpredictable that they need to ensure that they can protect themselves. There, there is a fear that spreading in the same fashion as this virus silently and quietly across America, the hearts of Americans. Someone has said this, that by some estimates, some 200 million Ameri Americans will eventually be infected by this virus. And if that pre prediction becomes a reality and the 3% death rate currently holds, that would mean that there would be over 6 million deaths here in America alone. And while we are learning more, it seems that moment by moment, there is still so much that we don't know, uh, so much that we may not know for some time, so, so much that we may never know about this virus, which is the, the, has this staggering power uh, to, to bring fear. And it's really the fear of the unknown. The Bible is God's message to man, and we are not without clear instruction from God's word concerning this circumstance that we're now facing. And very often when we face a dire circumstance, it forms sort of a black backdrop 
where the diamond of God's truth can be more clearly seen. And I believe we're getting into that position now. Uh, There's no doubt a message that God has for us against the backdrop of the coronavirus. Here's the question we're going to look at in this message. How are we to respond biblically in the midst of a restrictive, uncertain, and scary environment? I'm going to give you four biblical responses. And the first is this. We are, response number one, we are to respond obediently. Uh, The first thing that we can say is we have to obey and respond obediently to our government. God has designed human government for two purposes, to protect human life and property. And though it might seem that some of the restrictions that we have been placed under are excessive, they are not at odds with God's purpose for government, human government, which is to protect us. And so, folks, we must obey. That's why our meetings are not public uh, during these weeks. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2 says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So response number one, we must obey. We must obey. Response number two, we are to respond wisely. Not just obediently, but wisely. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, it says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We, we need to respond to all the things that have been happening around us these last few weeks uh, with, with wisdom. Someone has said that wisdom is simply seeing life from God's perspective. That's what the Bible gives to us. And during these days, folks, we must not live on the basis of our feelings, but on the basis of the wisdom that comes to us from God's Word and understanding the great truths of God's Word that flow out of the Bible. And so I'm going to give you two things from God's Word, two great things that we need to see from the Scriptures in order to navigate through these difficult days. I want you to see fear's priority and salvation's reality. Fear's priority. What is the number one thing that we ought to be afraid of? You know, there, there's so many things that we ought to fear. The other day, Barb and I were out in the backyard raking leaves, uh, and Barb was raking leaves at the corner of our uh, stone fence that we have in the backyard. There was a pile of leaves, and all of a sudden, this snake comes out, and it was ugly and it had a red tongue. And Barbara, I don't know if you knew this, but she's got about a 44-inch vertical leap. I mean, she leapt up into the sky and shouted, and... Uh, I got to be the hero, and so I went and I first informed that snake that he had seen his last sunrise and took a shovel, and I ended his existence. Don't do that to my girl, I said to him. But but folks, there's there are many things in this life that that we're afraid of that can cause us fear, and certainly that is the case with the coronavirus. But, but the question is, is the coronavirus our number one priority fear, the sum of all fears? In reality, we, we're afraid of anything that might kill us. Death, folks, listen, death is the ultimate thing that man fears. And underneath our fears about COVID-19 crawls this, this pervasive fear of death which enslaves the world. And the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, that the Lord Jesus came, listen, that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Now, think about what the coronavirus does to death. I read someone say this week, the coronavirus certainly does not make death more frequent because 100% of us die. And the percentage of people who die cannot be increased. We all die. 
coronavirus can can put several deaths earlier but I, I hardly suppose that is what we fear. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Yet, here is what, here's what the coronavirus does do and has done to death. It forces death into our thinking. It makes death real to us. And if, if you think of yourself as an eternal being who's going to live somewhere forever, that, that is one of the greatest blessings that you can have. And, and the reality of death has not been changed. Here's what's happened, folks. What has changed over the last several weeks, at least for some of us, is that we are now consciously considering the inevitability of what will certainly happen to every one of us. And believe me, that is a great mercy. It, the consideration of death and its reality is one of the great mercies that can happen in a person's life. And yet, sadly, today, still much of the world is, is still deaf to the divine warning of this global pandemic. But for a person to ask the question, what happens to me when I die, is, is one of the most value. It is perhaps the most valuable question a person can ask. And Jesus instructs us concerning the fear of death and what happens after you die. Jesus, folks, listen. Jesus is very clear on fear's priority, on what ought to be our number one fear. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. He says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, Fear him. J.C. Ryle makes the comment on these verses. He says the reality and the fearfulness of hell stand out awfully on the face of this verse. There is hell after death. The state of the wicked man is not annihilation. There is a hell which ought to be feared. There is a just God who will finally cast into hell the obstinately impenitent. Now listen, folks, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Every man has broken God's law and we earn from that the sentence of death. And hell is simply eternal death. There, there are two lives that we will all live, the one we're living right now in time and the one that is after death. And the one after death could be heaven, it could be hell. And these verses... Luke 12, 4 and 5 are teaching us the great truth that there's only one true legitimate cause for fear. Fear the one who determines your eternal destiny. Fear the one, the priority fear is the fear of the one who can cast one's eternal soul into an everlasting hell. But the great thing for us to remember during these uncertain days is not just fear's priority but also salvation's reality. There, there is a real salvation from the wrath of God to come. And I want you, if you have a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. The wrath of God against sin is real. It is deserved by every person ever born of the race of Adam. And yet the great message of the Bible is the message of a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. And this salvation is, is not something that you can earn or work for. It is accomplished by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, being made right with God, having righteousness before God is not a work to be achieved. It is a gift to be received by faith. Listen to Romans chapter 3. Verse 21, it says, but now, apart from the law, from the works of the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. He's saying here, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who they are. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
being justified, here comes as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This is saying God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sins and people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, folks, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, let me tell you what all that means. Go back to Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Jesus addresses these verses to followers and, or those who, who want to be his followers. And notice he says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, they have no more that they can do. He's saying if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and have received this salvation, been gripped by this salvation that is in Christ alone, you should never fear what can only kill the body. You, you, sh you don't need to fear a vampire. You don't need to fear a virus. J.C. Ryle says this, stay with me. He says, consider now the best remedy against lesser fears how are we to overcome these powerful feelings of fear and break the chains which fear throws around us? He says there is no remedy like that which the Lord Jesus recommends. We must supplant a lesser fear by a higher and more powerful principle, the fear of God. Folks, we must look away from those and that which can only hurt the body to him who has dominion over the soul. We must turn our, why, our eyes away from the people and the things that can injure us only, only in this life that is now. To him who can condemn to misery in the life to come. And here's what Ryle says. Armed with this mighty principle, we shall not play the coward. Seeing him that is invisible, we shall find the lesser fear, coronavirus, war, uh, disease, financial insecurity. We shall see all lesser fears melting away before the greater and the weaker before the stronger. In other words, well, listen to me. Stay here with me now. The bigger fear will deliver you from the smaller fear. And here's why. Here's why. Because the bigger fear, that is the one who has authority to cast into hell, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, has already been to hell for you and is offering himself to you as your Savior. He lived a life we couldn't live and died the death that we should have died. Folks, here's the message of the Bible. Jesus loved us so much that he paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we could never pay. Jesus loved us so much that he literally went to hell for us so he wouldn't have to live in heaven without us. And here's what Jesus has done. Jesus has transformed physical death, the physical death of his followers from a trip into terror into a journey into joy. <laughs> Turn to Revelation 21 and consider this. If you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, something like, and something like co coronavirus kills you, it has launched you into the ultimate journey into joy. Paul, Paul gives the, the most basic principle of heaven in Philippians 1, verse 21. He had seen a glimpse of heaven in 1 Corinthians 12, and, and he says this, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Heaven is gain, folks. The Christian is launched into the land of no longers. Look at Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle John says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he is he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. God is going to be in heaven with us and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will listen, no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or mourning or crying or pain for the first things have passed away. How do we respond to the coronavirus? Obediently, wisely. We must see things from God's perspective. Fear's priority. I need not fear the coronavirus. 
but if I have not yet experienced salvation's reality, I do need to fear the one I will face after death. Folks, what a, what a great time this is for, for all of us to consider our own death. And are we ready for eternity? Are we ready to, to face the one who has authority to cast into hell? Let me tell you a question I thought a lot about this week. And the question is, is why would the Lord Jesus cast anyone <laughs> into an eternal hell? And uh, as you look at scripture, um, because of God's justice and the law and the, the punishment that he has set up, every single one of us deserves to be cast into an eternal hell. The wages of sin is death. But I, I think there, there's another reason why people go and are, are, are cast into hell. Um, remember who Jesus is. He's the one who lived a perfect life, and then he went into an eternal hell that he did not deserve to deliver those from a hell that they do deserve for a heaven that they don't deserve. Why would Jesus judge anyone to such an eternal fate? And I think the answer must be simply this. People are cast into hell because they don't want to go to heaven. And here's what we need to understand about heaven. Heaven is a kingdom. 31 times in the book of Matthew, heaven is referred to as a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Heaven has a king. And, and heaven is a place where Jesus is king. <laughs> and what an amazing king. A king who made it possible for sinful men to go to a holy heaven, not by any work of their own, but by his own finished work on the cross folks i'm here to tell you the only reason why jesus the lord jesus would send a person to hell would be for their refusal to bow before him as king their refusal to give up control of their life for their sake people who go to hell don't want to go to heaven people who refuse to repent and to change their mind about jesus we must respond wisely fear has a priority the number one fear is the fear of the one who has the authority to cast into hell. And folks, salvation is a reality. The reality of salvation is experienced by those who bow before their Savior King, Jesus. And may I say this, those who experience the reality of salvation, we have nothing to fear, really. <laughs> those who have not experienced the the reality of salvation have everything to fear. So how do we respond to the coronavirus? We respond obediently and wisely, holding to the understanding of fear's priority and salvation's reality. Here's a third response that we should be having. We should respond evangelistically. Evangelistically. I listened to a perspective this week on coronavirus from John Piper, and here's what he called coronavirus. He called it God's thunderclap. He said that all natural disasters, whether floods, famines, locusts, tsunamis, diseases, are, are a thunderclap of God's mercy in the midst of a coming judgment, calling people everywhere to, to repent, to bow before King Jesus, to realign their lives by grace with the infinite worth of the glory of God. If you've been at Mariners not too long ago, I gave a message on Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 5, where some Jewish people came to Jesus and they asked him to make sense about some disasters that had recently happened in Jerusalem. Pilate, the governor, had, had slain uh, several people from Galilee who had come to worship at the temple. And the Tower of Siloam collapsed and 18 seemingly innocent bystanders were crushed by that, that collapse. And the crowds come to Jesus and they say, okay, Jesus, make some sense of this. What do you think about these natural disasters and this cruelty? I mean, those people were just standing there and they're now dead, Jesus. Or we could put the question this way. Jesus, tell us about this coronavirus and the thousands that have already died. Here's Jesus' answer. 
in Luke chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. He said this to the crowd. He says, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That is the message of Jesus to the world right now at this moment in history under the coronavirus, a message to every single human being, to me, to you, to everybody at Mariner's Church, every ruler, every person on this planet who hears about the coronavirus is receiving a thunderclap message from God saying, repent. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 91. A thunderclap is a sudden, powerful sound in the distance that alerts you to the reality that a storm is coming. And what do you do when you hear a thunderclap and the winds start to begin to blow? You, you head for shelter from the storm. And that is what we must evangelistically encourage people to do in these days, to love them enough to tell them, to lead them to the only shelter that there is from the judgment of God. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a shelter to protect. He's a rock that cannot be moved. We need to respond, folks. We, Mariner's Church, evangelistically to the coronavirus. I believe that there will be unprecedented opportunity to share the love of Jesus with people, to share fear's priority, but salvation's reality. Did you know that the most oft-repeated command in Scripture is fear not? We can live a life that overcomes fear through the Lord Jesus, and the only reason we are still here is to give the message that there is shelter from the coming storm of judgment. And that shelter is Jesus. And, and he's the shelter, if you're in Psalm 91 there, that is spoken of in Psalm 91. It says, he who dwells in the shelter in Jesus, the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper, and from the deadly pestilence. Does that sound like coronavirus? He will cover you with his pinions. Under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. He, you will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 on, on your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. If, we, if someone is taken, a Christian is taken out by the plague or the pestilence of COVID, God delivers vertically into heaven. With a long life, I will satisfy him and I will let him see my salvation. We're to respond, folks, obediently, wisely, evangelistically. Let me give you one more, just real quickly. We're to respond to all of this joyfully. You say, well, Bill, why should I be joyful and thankful for the coronavirus? I'll tell you, the, the number one reason is you're commanded to be thankful. In Philippians 4, verse 4, the Lord says, uh, Paul says, rejoice imperative rejoice in the lord and again a second time i will say rejoice there it is jesus commands me to be joyful always and even in the midst of the coronavirus he also says this in first thessalonians 5 18 in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you we we are to rejoice and give thanks in everything even the coronavirus and here's Here's why. It's not without reason. In Romans 8:28, uh, the scripture says, and we know that God causes all things, including coronavirus, to work together. It's not good in itself, but to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Listen, folks, mariners, God has called us to be different. And one of the great differences that, that it's between the world and us lies in the joy that we can find, that we can have an experience in the midst of a crisis and a trial 
such as this. And it is for that reason that starting next week, I'm going to begin a series of messages on the book of Philippians, which was written by the Apostle Paul on how to have joy in a restrictive environment. How can you have joy, folks, consistent joy, when you can't move around like you used to, when your options become limited? We're going to look at the answer to that question from the book of Philippians where Paul wrote from a Roman jail. So start reading the book of Philippians. Let me close by giving you a quick story, a true story about a man named Melvin Milligan from Prosaic, New Jersey. Uh, He was driving home from work one day and was thirsty. And so uh, he stopped into a convenience store in Montvale, New Jersey, uh, just to get a Coke. And he noticed as he walked in uh, in the window that the the big game lottery was up to $46 million. And even though he hardly ever bought a ticket, it was not something he did normally, he thought, well, what the heck? I'll just put some money down. And he bought five $1 tickets to the lottery. And so he picks his Coke Coke up, puts his tickets in his wallet, and he heads home. Uh, He goes upstairs, throws the the lottery tickets in a junk drawer, and that was on June the 9th, 2000. Well, time goes by, and he forgets uh, about the tickets. He kind of forgets that they're even there, and he just goes on living his life. Well, they have a a drawing for the winning lottery ticket, uh, and there's a one-year limit on people coming to claim their their winning ticket and as it gets down to the end of that time period because of the the amount of money the 46 million dollars the commission tries to reach out to find the winner and so on june 7th almost a total year later june 7th of 2001 melvin's sitting down with his wife watching the six o'clock news and they see this story come on the tv and they say the single winning lottery ticket for $46 million from a year before has not been claimed. And the person who has it has 36 hours to claim it. Otherwise, the one-year statute would run out and the ticket would become null and void. Someone was about to lose $46 million. And then they happened to flash on the TV screen the very convenience store where the ticket was bought in Montvale, New Jersey. Well, Melvin's sitting there watching TV with his wife. He's grabbing for another Dorito. And he says, you know, I think that that I bought some tickets at that convenience store a long time ago. And I I threw them upstairs in in a junk drawer. And Melvin's wife, what do you think she said? Get yourself up there right now and find those tickets. And so Melvin goes up and rummages around in his junk drawer for about 10 minutes, and yep, there they are, the five tickets. He goes down to the convenience store where he bought them, and and they start sticking them in the computer, and Katie barred the door. The second one that stuck into the computer is the winning ticket, and Melvin picks up $46 million. with less than 24 hours to go, it was. You say, well, why do I tell that story? Because uh, there's a free winning lottery ticket for every single one of us today. And let me tell you what you win with that ticket, something far greater, far more than $46 million. That ticket contains, listen, an escape from an eternal hell. It contains an entrance into an eternal blessed heaven, entrance into the family of God, the riches of heaven and eternal life. That ticket contains freedom from the penalty of sin, the guilt of sin. That that ticket contains the power to overcome sin on a daily basis. And one day, the power the, the, to be released from the presence of sin forever in the arms of the God of heaven, the Lord Jesus, who loved you enough to go to hell for you so that he could live in heaven with you forever. And, and he says, here's the ticket. It's available. And so my question to you is, is, where is the ticket in your life? Have you cashed in? Have you buried it under a bunch of junk in your life and maybe you've been asleep? 
And maybe today, maybe during this coronavirus season, you've heard God's thunderclap and all of a sudden it's awakened you. Maybe today, during this season, you now awaken to the need that you have for a Savior. Who's the one who cashes in the ticket? Well, it's the one who wants Jesus more than anything else. The one who bows the knee to Jesus Christ. Why am I telling this story? Because you don't have forever to redeem that ticket. Melvin didn't. You, there's a statute of limitations. You, you wait too long, it could be too late. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. And, and I say it to those who have already redeemed the, the ticket in these uncertain days. You don't have forever to tell those people that you love who have not been saved yet about the only one who can save them. Listen, what is the coronavirus? It is, it is God's thunderclap calling men and women, boys and girls, to repent and to come to Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Dear Father, thank you for allowing all of us to face this circumstance, not because it's a good thing in itself, but rather because of all the good that can come from it. Thank you that it is a thunderclap of your mercy, calling all men to repent and to turn to you. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that, that when they turn to you, that they will not find a judge, but a savior, one who has already judged their sin at the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus that those who turn to you will find love, true love. And thank you, as the scripture says, that there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And so I'm praying, Lord Jesus, for our church family in these days that we would experience your love as never before. And for the one who's never yet come to know it, I pray that today might be the day that they would redeem and cash in on the ticket. Lord, would you have your way, use this church during these days for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just want to encourage you um, to share with others the opportunity uh, to take part in our Sunday services that are going to be coming to you every week, next week, starting in the book of Philippians. It's a great way to reach out and a good way uh, to, to share that people can cash in on the ticket to eternal life. Uh, the second thing is I want to encourage you to please continue your giving to Mariners. Our church can only function through the generosity of our members. And even though we can't be together physically, uh, you can still mail your offering uh, to the Mariner's Church address here at uh, Bay 50. Uh, you can uh, get on the Mariner's Church app or the website and just hit the tab, give here. And we've, it's very easy to do that. So we just want to encourage you to, to keep giving so that we can continue to support our, our ministry and missionaries. And uh, I would really appreciate it if you would get in touch with us and let us know if you dialed in to today's service. Uh, we just want to hear that you're hearing from us. And also, we'd love to encourage you to send in a prayer request to also uh, give your comments and questions on the sermon or anything to do with the church. Uh, we just would love to hear from you. So I, I pray that you have a great Sunday. And we'll look forward to being back with you again soon next week. Remember, read the book of Philippians. Thank you.